welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast. I'm here to talk about getting rid of burnout, increasing job satisfaction, and feeling like an expert in what you do. One thing that created a lot of burnout and angst for me was trying to get continued medical education right at the last minute. So why not join the CME membership and do CME while listening to this podcast? Go to psychiatrypodcast.com, sign up, sign in, take the test, and the certification is emailed to you in seconds. Before I begin the episode, I wanted to give a brief introduction. Alzheimer's disease is a devastating neurodegenerative condition that affects the entire family. As psychiatrists and psychologists, we often support these patients and their families throughout the entire disease process. With recent and controversial FDA approval of aducanumab, a new pharmacotherapy for Alzheimer's disease, we can expect to be asked about this drug from our patients and their family. Initially, there was a lot of excitement from the scientific community when aducanumab and other similar pharmacotherapies first entered clinical trials. However, phase three clinical trial of several drugs in this class failed to show clinical improvement in memory and cognitive functions, despite their high efficacy in removing CNS amyloid plaques and the classic brain pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Therefore, it was a surprise to many scientists and clinicians when the FDA officially approved aducanumab on June 7, 2021. When we took a deep dive into the controversy, our findings were shocking. Not only is the new therapy aducanumab not effective in providing clinical benefits in memory and cognitive function, it is also associated with adverse side effects that we need to be ready to discuss in detail when the opportunity arises. Therefore, the entire FDA review and approval process of aducan umab, as well as a high price tag, is now under investigation by the Office of Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services and congressional committees. Essentially, this kind of is a different episode that looks at an important topic, dementia. We, towards the end, will hint at things that we do think work and that we can talk to patients about, including exercise, diet, sleep. But I was thinking about this episode and how similar this is to the Britney Spears conservator trial. Follow the money, <laughs> you know? There's corruption, guys. People are swayed consciously and unconsciously to do things based off of money. So none of the people on this episode have any conflicts of interest to discuss. We don't receive any money for drug companies, exercise companies, sleep companies, diet companies. And it is my great pleasure to have this interview with Dr. Shin and Dr. Osorio. Um, other things to announce is that on the website, psychiatrypodcast.com, we now have shirts that you can purchase. If you're a mental health professional, you can be rocking a nice psychiatry and psychotherapy podcast shirt. And other things to announce, we still have signups for emotionconnection.com. This is the microexpression training. If you are a student, there is a student discount, so you can go on there and find out about that. And thank you so much for your support, guys. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all your support in being able to promote good content, trying to look at the data as closely as I can with as little biases as I can. So here we go to the episode. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm joined with the amazing Dr. Carolina Osorio. She is a geriatric psychiatrist at Loma Linda, who I used to talk with on my breaks, who I miss dearly. And she was on some prior episodes. She runs an amazing program for dementia, IOP. She does outpatient psychiatry, some inpatient psychiatry. She does it all. And then also joining me today and Dr. Sorio is medical student and PhD graduate, Sam Shin who did a PhD focusing on neuroinflammation. So he knows quite a bit about Alzheimer's disease. It was one of the topics he dug into on a deep level and a recent level, which is nice because we like to look at the most recent data. So we are just going to jump right in to the topic. And 
I am going to bring up the slides. If you go to my resource library, we'll give you a copy of the slides, a copy of the paper that Sam is working on. So Dr. Soria, you want to start maybe and talk a little yeah, bit about course, what yeah. we're looking at here today? Right. So today we're going to talk about um, the main thing is we're going to talk about the new Alzheimer's drug that was recently approved on June 7th of this year. It has a complicated name, but the brand name is Aduhome and the generic name goes by Aducanumab. So the reason why I'm very passionate about educating and talking about this recently approved drug is because um, when it came out, it came out with a lot of high hopes to uh, treat, to modify Alzheimer's disease, which is, we know it's a terminal illness, it's a neurodegenerative process, and therefore one of the most difficult illnesses to have as a patient and also as a family member and, and as the caregivers of the family members and as, a, as a, in the community as well. So um, when this came out, I was kind of a little bit sort of like, really, this is really true? Am I going to finally going to give some hope to my patients that maybe we could improve their symptoms? So I started looking into this medication and then immediately all of the other doctors that are part of my institution and also treat Alzheimer's, we started to uh, chat, text, and finally decided to get together in a meeting after we had reviewed a lot of the data, a lot of the information, and what really was going on with this medication. And um, in between this and that, um, I came across Sam, who came to um, work with me for two weeks. And we both have like the same kind of theories behind Alzheimer's. And it was just really amazing that he came at that moment because we were able to, you know, explore more the, the research, the evidence, the pathophysiology, and then he put up a small presentation for the department. And then now we want to just spread more um, of what we know to everybody out there. So we all are very well informed about this new medication. Excellent. Yeah. So this is this is a place where Dr. Soria is in the trenches. She's seeing these patients every day. She's having long conversations with family. And so she's imagining, you know, as she's going through this, am I going to be having conversations about this new medication? I'm going to have tons of patients who are hearing about it. And the controversy, I think, is pretty interesting. So Sam, why don't you jump into a little bit about what you found in the news, the high cost and so forth? Yeah, so there's actually quite a few layers to the controversy surrounding the FDA approval of map. One thing, I'll start with the cost. It's going to cost about $56,000 a year. It is designed as a 14-month treatment, so a little over that, probably over the course of the treatment. And that is, that is a lot of money. And we have to remember that this is a very vulnerable population when if you know anybody with Alzheimer's or have, have been taking care of them from a clinical perspective, you know that they will hold on to anything. So even if it costs a lot of money, people yeah. are more likely to go with it if there's even a sliver of hope. And that's where the cost comes in. I just want to kind of um, talk about this $56,000 a year because we have many interventions that are more expensive than that. But the take-home point here is that it's um, not very efficacious. Yeah, and that would be like, okay, if it, if it was the cure, it might make sense for some people to pay that much or insurance to drag us through a bunch of prior authorizations to get that medication. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of hype about the cost of the drug when it came out. But what's more important, I guess, from a clinical perspective is the lack of evidence. And uh, we'll get into the, you know, the details of what Biogen, uh, the, the company that made this drug, had presented to the FDA. Uh, we're going to go into that deeper later. Uh, but the cost is definitely something that stands out. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Soria, tell me a little bit about the Alzheimer's disease public health crisis. 
Yeah, so we know today that Alzheimer's is a public health crisis. Right now, it is costing Medicare about $799 billion. So imagine, it's already a super expensive illness, and you want to sell a medication that is $56,000. So put that in perspective. There are more than 6 million Americans living with Alzheimer's, and by the year 2050, that is projected to rise to about 13 million, which is one in nine people who are above the age of 65. More than 11 million Americans provided, uh, provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's and other dementias. So this it is relating to caregivers, right, who are you know, who have their loved ones. Um, in my practice, most of what I see is either the husband taking care of the wife. Be, and in my practice, because we know that Alzheimer's is more common in women. Um, so that is what I tend to see more. But of course, I also have wives taking care of their husbands. And a lot of the times they don't really have the means to hire someone. So for in-home health care, the only, in California, the only, um, Insurance that can't pay for that is Medi-Cal. And in order to be a Medi-Cal person, you need to be, um, you know, be very poor. And a lot of these patients uh, don't meet, you know, that criteria of uh, poverty levels to be able to uh, apply for Medi- Medi-Cal, which is also known as Medicaid. So these people are taking care of them. And so um, in 2020, um, it is um, estimated that about 50.3 billion hours of caregiver is given and is uh, valued about $257 million. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge stress for families. And I, I think people don't really realize that unless they're in the trenches doing it day in and day out. Right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Alzheimer's maybe some definitions, what what are some of the things that have historically been thought to be the cause? So Alzheimer's disease, um, we classically describe it as progressive and fatal neurodegenerative condition. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis, meaning that we make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia in clinic based on you know what we find on history, as well as there's... Um, uh, quite a few uh, test, cl- cognitive testing modalities that we can use. Yeah, it used to be confirmed more probably on autopsies um, for pathologic markers. Now, with so many people having this condition, it is not as uh, much of a routine practice. And overall, Alzheimer's disease is estimated to be responsible for up to 80% of all clinical dementias. And when we're talking about the pathology that I mentioned, uh, it's classically associated with beta amyloid proteins and tau neurofibrillary tangles. Those are kind of the step one buzzwords. Um, And they they will come back to them because they have had um, a huge impact on how we do research in Alzheimer's and how we go about developing therapy. At this point, as we're speaking, there's really no cure. And we do have um, four... FDA approved therapies, pharmacotherapies prior to aducanumab. And the effects, clinical effects of those have been quite minimal, especially when we're looking at the long term. So, this is um, a, you know, a very devastating disease that affects you know, someone's life from 65 or 70 and on for a long time until they die. So, Dr. Soria, break down a little bit about the history of. Alzheimer's disease for us? Yeah, so in 1906, uh, there was this person called Alois Alzheimer, and he was the very, very first person to report senile plaques and interstellar narrow fibrillary fibrillary tangles in the brain. And he observed this in a patient, 51-year-old female, who had died, I mean, at 51, had died from advanced dementia. So you can only imagine this disease had been already affected uh, this person's brain even 10, 20 years before, because we know Alzheimer's, when it's symptomatic, it's been more than 10 years uh, that the disease has been um, affecting the brain. But um, it wasn't until 1984, you know, with modern biochemistry and cell biology tools um, that the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles were analyzed, and they were described as the main components of Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, the amyloid plates were basically um, amyloid, um, beta amyloid proteins that were deposited. 
And that was the very first one. And then in 1986, um, they talked about the neurofibrillary tangles, which is a microtubule binding protein to tau. So, and then that's how, you know, they put them together and how we came with this new theory that Alzheimer's was caused by, you know, um, these two, the fibrillary tangles and the amyloid proteins. So the amyloid beta will generate, uh, will accumulate in the brain and that will cause abnormal tau phosphorylation. And then the tau will aggregate into neurofibrillary tangles and this combination will cause neural death. And then with time, as the cells died, there was a loss of cognitive function that eventually, you know, um, will take completely over the brain and the person, you know, eventually will die. Mm. So the prediction was that if you reverse the amyloid, you will reverse or delay Alzheimer's disease. But after 30, almost 30 years um, of active research, there has been not one single amyloid targeting therapy that has been shown to be clinically ben- beneficial. You can have someone have a PET, an amyloid PET scan and have that brain with a lot of beta amyloid and be totally cognitive intact. Or you can have a person who has very little amyloid deposit and have cognitive problems. So there's really no clinical correlation of the imaging findings with the cognitive status of the person. Yeah, so this is starting to make me question what I learned in medical school just a couple years ago, you know, or a decade ago, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, let's... and, And there's also this idea that not Alzheimer's are the same. And that's, um, Sam, why don't you talk a little bit about that? The three subtypes. Yeah. So this idea that not Alzheimer's is the same, you know, really shouldn't come as a surprise, you know, given, you know, current advances in so many diseases we're uh, starting to find heterogeneity and complexity in just about every disease process that we learn about. And, you know, when, the amyloid hypothesis first made, it was kind of the best thing we had at the time. We had just disca- discovered what the plaques are made of. We just figured out what the, the, the aggregates are, that they were tau proteins. So, you know, based on that, this dogma was created that, you know, it's a series of events that lead to neuronal death and cognitive dysfunction and, and this syndrome that we see clinically. Well, since then, um, we've found quite a few things about um, Alzheimer's disease and combining kind of what we find from the public health side, as well as the genetic side and what we see in clinical setting. It's really, there's multiple subtypes. So the first one is what's commonly known as the familiar Alzheimer's disease, or also known as early onset Alzheimer's. And this, this only affects about probably less than 5% of all Alzheimer's. And there actually has been mutations that have been described amyloid precursor protein, presinella 1 and 2, these mutations cause abnormal amyloid biology. And when these things were coming out right after the amyloid hypothesis, it really fed the hypothesis, gave it a lot of support saying, hey, look, we are, we're finding out mutations that lead to this disease. Um, another support, and, and another, which describes a second category, is the trisomy 21 Down syndrome. So APP gene, which is the precursor to amyloid beta, is actually on chromosome 21. So uh, trisomy 21 patients have an extra copy of APP gene. And we know from the clinical side that uh, many Down patient syndromes, uh, uh, syndrome, Down syndrome patients develop early onset Alzheimer's. And it's, it can be as early as in their 40s. So these two things these two subtypes, you know, really supporting the amyloid hypothesis. Now, the thing that is often forgotten, and this is a disconnect between basic science and clinical uh, clinical science, is that the majority of Alzheimer's, more than 90%, falls under what's called the sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So this is actually what we clinically see most often, usually happens after age of 65, well into their 70s. This is the slow insidious uh, disease process that we see and we have to support our patients through for many years, sometimes up to two decades. Now, this portion and the largest population, the ideology in this group is really not well-defined because it's not 
direct amyloid biology. And we, we are doing a lot of genetic-based research where now we're seeing, and there's a table we'll include that kind of has many, many genes involved in multiple processes. But what we can say is that the sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form, is truly heterogeneous in uh, the etiology of the disease. Okay. So that's, um, that's how, still fairly genetic, largely heritable, but it's not associated with genetic mutations directly related to the amyloid biology, that, that largest group. That's, um, that's interesting. Wait, you want to think about these sporadic Alzheimer's as an epigenetic illness, right? Where you have this sort of group of genes, but not very clear, but then you need to have like an environmental something trigger that actually, you know, targets all these, this pathology and then, you know, the disease progression. Okay. And before we keep going, I just want to clarify something. Um, when I said about the cost, um, it's $799 billion of total Medicare spending in 2019. And from that number, 355 only for Alzheimer's disease. So I think that's even more. Um, wow. Impactful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. That's a huge proportion. So, okay, so we've talked about how not, Alzheimer, not all Alzheimer's disease are the same. There's a lot of different genes involved. So it may be hard to identify an early causative factor, especially if there's so many different causes. Well, is that? I'll, I'll just speak kind of generally on these genes because, you know, we can get very nitpicky, but yeah, we big don't picture, do that. it's really genes involved in like cholesterol metabolism, uh, metabolic pathways, a lot of inflammatory genes. So what I guess I meant to kind of convey earlier is that it's not just this one biological process where amyloid precursor protein turns into amyloid. Everything was focused on how that process happens, but we're seeing that like biggest risk factor for developing Alzheimer's, for example, APOE4, uh, it's a cholesterol related gene. So we need to start looking more into other biological processes that are involved in development of Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Yeah. So tell me about, so there's cholesterol, there's inflammation. Is, is the inflammation localized? Like if you tested a CRP or an ESR, those high, is, is, is the inflammation like, how do we know there's inflammation? I guess would be my question. Well, Dr. Surya, do you want to talk about the type 3 diabetes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, there's... Um, so we know that there are a couple of very important risk factors for Alzheimer's. And those have to do with sort of like midlife management of hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. So um, we do say that there's this, what we call type three diabetes, um, which is basically people who have Alzheimer's. And um, it has to do with the, these midlife risk factors, you don't control well for them. And so you start having changes in your brain, mostly related with micro ischemic vascular changes. So it's not like you have a stroke and then you have cognitive problems. These are people who have like no physical symptoms whatsoever, but with poorly controlled diabetes, these very tiny, it's like micro, micro tiny ischemic changes that will eventually cause cognitive impairments. And so that is why it's so important that we make this difference because we know today, we have lots of evidence, lots, lots of research that shows that there are other things that we can do in our life to actually prevent having this disease. And there are even cases where you have like mild cognitive impairment and you can reverse that. If you are very, very mindful about your lifestyle and all these interventions that we can talk about um, at any other time um, that can help you um, reverse those cognitive impairments. Well, I think I want to get to that because I think that's what people are probably going to be most interested in. 
So we're moving beyond the amyloid hypothesis. We're looking at metabolism, inflammation, and genetics, and how those all sort of interact around stress. I, I think that one of the big pictures that I have is like people used to die of infections, right? A hundred years ago. Now people are dying of chronic stress. And yes, it's yes. like the big picture is what does chronic stress look like? It looks like hypertension, prediabetes, diabetes, obesity. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people headed towards that bad diet, low exercise, under exercised, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other comments on this sort of big paradigm shift? Yeah. So the type three diabetes is like kind of a phrase, uh, nickname that kind of was coined for Alzheimer's disease, because all these studies were showing that if you have diabetes, insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia, metabolic syndrome, obesity, uh, your, your, even something like your how big your waist measurements are, these things were all shown to be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So clearly things that we can have some control over like diet and exercise are going to have um, an impact in managing Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, so, and, and I think I just wanna mention this really quickly is, you know, a lot of patients say, um, well, you know, they're, they be criteria for obesity and they said, oh, but my labs are all normal. So why should I worry about my weight? And I think why you should worry about your weight is because all that visceral fat that accumulates, meaning that fat that is, is inside your belly around all your organs, that fat is causing a chronic state of inflammation in your body. And that eventually is going to have consequences like, you know, Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And um, this fits well in inside my thoughts on the importance of exercise and diet and lifestyle, you know, and so some things like we cannot improve with medications, right? So I think it's really mm -hmm. important as doctors to direct people towards what is going to be the biggest win. Exactly. Even if that biggest win is really difficult. Losing weight is like agonizingly difficult. You know, as someone who yeah. is probably predisposed towards being too heavy, it's like you lose some and then you gain some and then you lose some. And then right, yeah. it's like, try to maintain a normal exercise life as a psychiatrist. Good luck. You know, right. there's just like you're right. on call one weekend and then the next week, next day, you're just totally out of it. And I know me and Dr. Osorio, we, we've been on our own oh, our yeah, journeys there. Yeah, we, yeah, we definitely share the same concepts. And so I, I, I also struggle with this weight thing and, and the stress management and all this. And on top of it, I decided to test my genes and I happen to have a copy of Papo E4. And so that just increases a bit my risk for Alzheimer's. And I am very cognizant of my lifestyle because I know there is the evidence, everything, the lifestyle can trump genes. And so I'm not perfect, right? And then uh, I fell back and forth, but I overall try to maintain a good lifestyle so that I can live long and healthy because I don't believe in lifespan. I believe in health span. If I want to be 80 or 90s, I want to be in the best condition that I can possibly be. Okay. So I, I know that some people are going to be interested in the nuts and bolts. And so we'll give them, we'll give them that in the handout of this new medication, but just like your summary of your dive into it and you guys, you know, you have slide after slide on this. I'm it seems like if you could give me the big picture, like what happened and what your conclusions are, Dr. Osorio and mm -hmm. Dr. Shin, that would be helpful. Yeah, I've done actually some extra digging since we put this together. I think we put it together right when the drug came out. Okay. And actually right. there's been a little more. So I'll kind of start here and then Dr. Osorio and fill me in. So Really, the big picture, the controversy all started with FDA approving the drug against its own committee. There's an independent committee um, that oversees this process, and all 11 members have voted against the drug being approved. Nevertheless, FDA, uh, a few months later, approved the drug. And now there is um, congressional hearing committees. There's actual investigations going on um, from the Office of um, Inspector General. Um, 
And they are looking at financial ties between Biogen, the company, and the FDA foundation. There's allegations of the FDA personnel, people high up on the list um, there, having private meetings and so forth, which are all against uh, the process where, you know, the FDA process that's supposed to keep this process, you know, as fair as possible for public benefit. So that's kind of the main thing as far as the controversy. There's, as far as the drug itself is concerned, it's it's not efficacious. And what I mean by that is at phase three trials, they had two phase three trials. So they usually have a parallel trials. Now, this is the phase where you're supposed to prove efficacy of the drug over thousands of patients. They had about 1,600 patients on each arm. And what had happened is that halfway through the study, uh, they did their internal analysis and realized, oh, the futility analysis shows that this drug actually doesn't help. One group, one of the arms showed mild improvement. The other arm showed mild worsening. So when you average the two, it was exactly almost at zero as far as efficacy is concerned. And, and it was actually pulled by the company. But what happened is because it cost the company over $16 billion in stock when it when the news was announced and you know that these are being pulled and the studies are stopped, there was now, and this is the part where it's being investigated called, uh, there was this secret mission project on Inks is what the Biogen um, people internally called it to basically lobby the FDA uh, and reanalyze all this data, really do fancy statistics, trying to get this drug approved. And they're, I mean, they have slides after slides. There's a uh, hundred plus slides on how they justify this. But the bottom line is they are essentially saying out of the two parallel studies, we're going to just, we're going to drop one and just look at one because that one showed efficacy. The other one, I, we believe it had too many outliers. There were only nine outliers in the group out of 1,600. So they're using the nine patients as an excuse to drop an entire arm of the study. And, and of course, the review committee said this is nonsense, but it was still approved on the basis of it's controversial. So that's kind of the quick summary of all the nuts and bolts and you know the graphs that uh, we have in there for anybody who's interested in looking at it further. Wow. Um, Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, and you didn't, yeah. That's really the most important part is it was all this process about how a drug is approved by the FDA, uh, what really happened, why this drug was approved when everybody else voted no. And so, you know, and leading to the current, you know, investigation that is happening as we speak. I do want to just quickly say that it was very clear that the drug removes amyloid. And, and I do also want to say yes. that many other companies had similar drugs at the same time that also show that. And many of the 400 trials I mentioned before also did that. So it wasn't a question about whether it removes amyloid. It was, does it improve memory? Does it improve function? And, and that's the part where it's been, no, it doesn't, which kind of, you know, brings the whole thing back to amyloid. Well, are we looking at the right thing then? Yeah. So, you know, I'm looking at the FDA data here, this, this slide you have on how much does it change mini mental status examination, right? And um, it's, we're not looking at a huge change <laughs> at the end of the day. Like, so mini mental status is out of like 30, right, Dr. Osorio? And, 30, you yeah. know, 18 is considered, oh wait, no, let me get this right. So mini mental status is out of 30 points, greater than 25 is normal, less than 10 is severe dementia. And even the data that they're presenting, it doesn't look like you're getting much more than a one or two point change, depending on the titration. I mean, if you compare it to placebo. Right, yeah. So in a clinical setting, it really comes down to when you ask the patient, hey, where are you? And if they can say the city, but not the county, but then the next time they can say the county and the city, is it's, that's the one point right there. So it's it's really not a big difference. But you're saying like even after you looked at the data further, 
because of this, uh, oh, was that phase two that I was looking at there? This was phase one. Okay, so I- That was phase one. So I'm talking about phase one data. So when yeah. we look further at the, at the phase three data, it's even less convincing. Yeah, so for phase one through three, they had a bunch of measurements, but what they used as a primary endpoint or kind of, if this doesn't show improvement, like everything else is pointless, was the CDR, clinical dementia rating. It's on MD Calc. It's used very frequently, not just in psychiatry, but you know other services mm-hmm. to kind of quickly assess the severity of dementia. So at best, uh, study 302, which is a study they wanted to keep, Uh, it improved the CDR rating by about one when you give high doses of of this drug. Uh, When you scroll to the next slide and look at uh, the other study that they wanted to drop or say it's invalid, uh, it actually worsened the CDR scoring by one. So if you have 1,600 on each arm and one... (laughs) One is negative one, one's positive one. It's you know, it's really zero when you combine them two, and that's that's what dropped this all together back in 2019, until you know they did the gymnastics trying to prove it. And there's a slide on some of the rationale, and it kind of is important for you know medical students or people taking boards. This idea about confidence interval, confidence interval, 95 percent interval. Um, you know, the take home point is if there's a line down to zero and um, if all of the error bars don't, are not on one side or the other, if any little bit crosses, that means no significant significant difference. This is something that's, you know, drilled into us in medical school. You need, it, what it means is you need more people or increase your N to really shift the, the error bars one way or another, right? So they have, I mean, slides after slide where they break these groups down into every little possible group. And they say, look, all of these subgroups are showing a trend. Therefore, approve our drug. Uh-huh. We don't approve drugs at the FDA level based on a trend. And there's a slide where, I mean, they just basically single out the entire 1600 patient phase three trial saying that it's it's insignificant because of the number of outliers, yeah, which I briefly mentioned, but again, it was a very small number of outliers. And even when you take the outliers out and do redo the analysis, it doesn't change the analysis. That's the funny part. That's the part where how do you then justify this this approval, right? <laughs> right, and it's not only that it could that it you know does it help, but what are the side effects and the cost of very no, no change, right? So if, if it's not doing anything, when you add both studies together and then the adverse effects, they're talking about vasogenic edema. Yeah, so the, uh, the most scary adverse effect of this, um, aside from headaches and things like that, is what's called ARIA. It stands for amyloid-related imaging abnorm- abnormalities. This is a very soft name because it, what it really should be called is um, vasogenic edema or uh, microhemorrhages related to amyloid removal therapy. If I say it that way, I think patients are going to be a lot more scared because I'm saying if we give this drug, there's a high chance that you're going to develop significant brain swelling that, that results in all sorts of downstream consequences or you could even have a hemorrhage. But it's appropriately named, you know, imaging abnormalities when in reality it's much more than just imaging abnormalities. Hmm. Yeah, and it's up to, I uh, think it's up to 30% of patients can have this severe side effect. So again, yeah. if you put together the lack of um, improvement on symptoms, the cost of the drug and the side effects is definitely something that the vast majority of physicians are not willing to endorse. And another thing is that you actually have higher incidence of uh, this aria, edema, and hemorrhage if you are an uh, APOE epsilon-4 carrier. So earlier we talked about APOE epsilon-4 being 
a significant risk factor for Alzheimer's. So it actually doubles your risk if you're a carrier from about 20% to 43% of developing ARIA. So, you know, it really doesn't fit where you have more side effects in the population that are most affected by this disease. So that's just something to also kind of remember when we're discussing this with uh, our yeah. patients. Yeah. Well, essentially you're attaching a monoclonal antibody to a part of the brain, telling the brain to clean up this piece of foreign invader. And so the brain doesn't know that that isn't a virus or that isn't a bacteria in the brain, you know, that this antibody is now hitting. And so you're going to have some side effects from that potentially. Is that kind of how you see it, Dr. Soria? Yeah, in a way. And so now that you mentioned that, um, let me tell you a natural way of getting rid of amyloid beta proteins in your brain. Oh, gosh. And that... that's called that's called sleep. Sleep? Oh, my gosh. Six to eight hours. Yes. Sleep. So that, yes, sleep. Get out. That when you're sleeping, yes, when you're sleeping, your brain is getting rid of amyloid beta proteins in your Wait, brain. Wait, Dr. Soria, before you say this. Are you? Do you have any conflicts of interest to report, Sam or Dr. Osorio? No, at no, all. Sam, do you have any conflicts of interest to report? Okay, you're not paid by the some sort of sleeping company or who? Uh, who no, I, I where, do not have that conflict of interest. Where's the sleep <laughs> lobby when you need them, Dr. Osorio? <laughs> I want to know where the sleep lobby is. You know, <laughs> like who cares about our sleep as doctors? Right? It's like. All right. Like, yes. From years and years of being on call, if you're listening to this, you can probably relate, you know? I mean, especially if you're in the trenches of some psychiatric hospital, listening to this on on your way to work or from work. Okay, so sleep. Sleep is important. Yeah. Okay, give me some give me some other like what one thing that I looked at was uh this this study on strength training and we're going to look me and Sam are going to bring this back for part 2, okay? But it really looks like it slowed down the cognitive decline, the normal sort of amount of brain loss that there was per year. But I want to, I, I, I want to like have Sam dig into this and give us a proper PhD level analysis on this. So there's, <laughs> there's exercise. Is there any data to support that if you exercise, like that's going to decrease your chance of Alzheimer's? Like, is that exercise? Oh, absolutely. So, um, so it's again, it goes down to lifestyle modifications, right? So, yeah. uh, stress management, sleep, nutrition, physical activity, avoiding risky substances, um, all of that stuff. It's like, I mean, like goddess treatment for your brain and your overall health. Okay. So, with exercise, let's say you're a mental health professional and you're listening to this. And you're like, I do no exercise. What should I do, Dr. Osorio? I'm worried now. I don't want to develop Alzheimer's. I have a family member with Alzheimer's. What do you say to them? Yes. Okay, so I can give you this. Um, see if you can relate to these. There was a point in my life that when I had my first job, I was overwhelmed with stress. I was so tired that I will be in the couch every day, all the time when I was at home. So um, I put weight. And I was feeling literally sick. Anyways, bottom line, I decided at that time that I had to change. But I wasn't a couch potato. I was not moving at all. I was totally sedentary. So what I did is I, uh, first thing I did is I got a pedometer and I started counting my steps. And so it's not about like exercising. It's about moving your body. So if you don't move your body at all, start with small things like counting your steps. Yep. Then, um, you know, then I realized that I was doing like a thousand steps a day. And then I start building this program where I would increase it every week by 500. And then um, out of nowhere, I started doing 7,000 steps. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to go the extra step because I feel better. And I downloaded an app for a 5K. And in a year or so, I became a half marathon runner from being a couch potato. Like even when I say this today, I am totally perplexed that I was able to get so far, um, just starting by counting my steps. You know, I when I think of Dr. Osorio, I think of someone who's very in shape, actually, and very Thank health you. conscious. 
Yes, I'm very health very health conscious. I um we'd we'd go out to eat at a really nice restaurant in town, and she would get like this like super healthy thing. That's just how you roll. So I, I appreciate that about you, Doctor Soria. I think um you know wherever you start is where you start. All you need to do is create some small mm-hmm. stress on your body, mm-hmm. allow your body to recover, and then you adapt, and then you repeat that cycle right. over and over and over again. So when you're just starting, just literally getting out of the house for like a 20 minute walk is going to be a big enough stress to cause an adaptation. And you could just do that every day, right? Or vary it up. So sometimes I'll have patients who then they start getting like some sort of pain from walking a lot. It's like, okay, let's jump on a bike. Let's jump on a rower. I've I've been going out on the water. It's like incredibly beautiful rowing every morning, doing some... I have like a lifting coach. I'll post some pictures to Instagram if you want to go check it out. Support my progress. I still have I still have uh, progress to make though, you know? So it's a journey. It is a journey. It's a journey. Yeah. What about you, Sam? Um, you know, there was this um, concept that I picked up from this podcast earlier called kind of the difference from fixed mindset to kind of having an open mindset that you can change. And I think for me, I was for so many years, I mean, I've been in medical school and graduate school for almost a decade now thinking, oh, I'm so busy. I don't have time to exercise. And, you know, I was never an athletic person growing up. So that was another thing like, oh, that's just not my thing. But I think just a little things like, well, I'm not fit to I'm not fit yet. You know, it's, it's a small change, um, but it kind of gives me this hope, like, okay, I'm going to just do a little thing here and a little thing there. And, 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 and it just gets me going. I actually got the cheapest roller I can buy. Nice. Good for you, bro. <laughs> and, 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 and I've been just getting on it when I can for 15 minutes. There and you and, go. The, and exactly. before what inhibited was, I don't have time. I'm too tired. Oh, yeah. But now it's like, well, I'm just going to try for a little bit. And and if I stop at seven minutes, so that's seven minutes more than nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. I, for the rower, I would say just get on for three minutes. That give yourself a nice five minute break, drink some water, walk around, get on for another three minutes and repeat, you know, do that three sets of three. And then every other day, add five seconds. So you literally, the second time you do it, three sets of three minutes and five seconds, and then take a nice five minute break each, you know, and you can, you can increase that. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's so important to just start somewhere, right? So that's one thing you can do. Mm-hmm. The other thing is is diet. I um I think I'm big on like avocado. Dr. Sorry, what do you think about avocado for the brain? It's wonderful. Almond butter, I, and I don't, nuts. Yeah, I don't I don't want to say uh diet. I want to say um healthy choices. Okay. Right? Because when you say diet, it sounds very restrictive and we know that restriction doesn't you need to do something that is sustainable. Yep. So yeah, um, healthy fats, avocado, uh, nut oil, you know, like cashews, um, uh, those are very good. Um, walnuts, um, l- there's a lot of research on how good that's for your brain. And then you also have the omega-3. So like I consume a lot of salmon. So if you don't eat fish, there are, uh, if you're vegan or whatever, we have flaxseed, you know, there's a lot of sources for these very good oils. Yep, flaxseed, chia seed, just I just prescribed it to a patient, told them they they soaked their oatmeal overnight. And so I said, throw in mm-hmm. two tablespoons yeah. of chia seed into that with the oatmeal. Um, right. And just that small shift and add a little bit of almond butter in the morning. This person needs to gain weight. So they, they need to add some food mm-hmm. fats, to their fats, to their diet. Um, but even just these small changes can make a big difference. So. Um, I always, you know, I had a really good dietitian that worked with me, with me for a while, actually on my own sort of patterns. And mm-hmm. one thing that she says, and I'll have her on in the future, is she talks about what is the smallest change that works for you that would make the biggest impact, you know? So for me, it was, I was using way too much fats on food just mm-hmm. to increase the flavors and the, I'm, I'm such a foodie, you know? And so it was like limiting it to a certain amount per meal, right? And that just started to to make a huge difference to lose some weight. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I'm um I'm on a journey here. If you're listening to this, I imagine you could be on a journey too to improving your margin, right? Because margin, rest, improving your sleep, yeah. diet, exercise, the simple things, the hard things, right? Incredibly hard to change. I don't know what's more. So you 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 choose your heart, right? Your heart is either exercising, watching for your food and all that stuff, or your heart is to be overweight and then eventually having diabetes, hypertension, dementia, et cetera. So you choose your heart. Yep. And so the if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I've tried this, I've tried exercise, you know, I'm a I'm a psychiatrist, I'm listening to this, you know, think about how do you change your environment to make this happen? So the biggest environmental change that I've done is actually hiring people, you know, that can coach me and inspire me and, you know, keep me accountable. So if you are in the trenches and you are busy and your life is busy, I've, I've coached a couple physicians and just decreasing the amount of time they work for a six month period. So I have one person I'm coaching currently and we had, we've, we've moved his day to end like three hours earlier so that he can go exercise so that it's not like he's just adding on to his life, you know? No, exactly. And then he has someone doing his meal prep once a day. So it's like, that's taken care of. So it's like, he's getting some structure to his life that is allowing him to make these huge transformations. Dr. Soria, what are you thinking? No, I mean, you know, you and I, we think the same, right? And, and so forth, we have a small practices on our side surrounding coaching because we believe in these and, and it works. So, um, you know, um, if you have the ways to get yourself a coach. So, so Dr. Sorry, if I was a professional, I'm going to put, I'm going to put the link on with this research yeah. library for Dr. Sorry, because I know she could be a great advocate to you. Um, you have some slots open for people doing the lifestyle type of stuff as well. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. And she's on, she's on Instagram. I'll link her Instagram as well. I'll share her profile on my profile, but she's a great one to reach out to. Yeah. So what I tell people is I want you to work on your lifestyle so that you never, ever have to go to see me on my other job where I work with the very sick people. And you say that with a micro expression of anger, Dr. Soria, because <laughs> you're so passionate about this. I I really am. I believe in it. Yeah. It's it's like I need coaching from you. Okay, we'll get some coaching. We'll trade some coaching. All right. Well, um, yeah, anything else on the top of your mind, Sam, that you didn't say that you wanted to say? Well, like you've mentioned, I think we'll come back to kind of discuss the diet and exercise, the science behind that and the relationship to Alzheimer's or cognitive function. Also, we'll be uh, hoping to look at the microbiome and its relationship to Alzheimer's disease or cognition. Mm-hmm. Um, so Absolutely. that would be something very interesting and that I'm I'm very interested in uh, just from personal, you know. Also, also I would say therapy, Sam, because oh, there's something yes. about chronic stress and the, yeah. the big things that I, I say to clients is there's like healthy diet exercise, therapy, and sometimes looking for that more meaning, more purpose, kind of that third arm, the logo yeah. therapy approach. I would say those are the three sort of pillars for me. So we, we should look at like, we should yeah. look at all three of those. No, it's, it's for sure. And I, I'm just kind of laughing here because I can't believe I didn't talk about you know, depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, and that, the, the relation for, with, you know, mental psychiatric illness to cognitive function. And think, think about it like this. You're, yeah. you're if, if someone is chronically stressed out, right. From either PTSD, depression, high anxiety, they're chronically stressed out. And then you put on top of that, nothing that cools down the fire, diet, exercise, sleep, it's just, it's just, it's just a tough situation, right? And so this is what we see. We see people at all stages of this process, and we don't have. I, I get excited about doing a podcast on it because it's like I know that there's twenty thousand providers now that will potentially 
change the the world right, right. yeah if we all kind of like do our part and start with ourself mm-hmm. i think mm-hmm. that can change the world so thank you thank you sam uh, dr sorio any final comments no, I, I love the part of therapy. Um, I think that we uh, think about trauma as like a war or sexual abuse. And in trauma, there's what we call the big T and the small T, right? And there's day-to-day things that are traumatic, especially in medicine, when we are encountering death and, you know, uh, angry patients, all of that is traumatic. And we're very good at burying that under the rug. And, and it will definitely have an effect down the road. I'm actually going to do a presentation in November about PTSD and aging and the correlation of PTSD and dementia, uh, because that is another risk factor for yep. it. Dr. Osorio and I are actually working on a screening project where we're doing early screening for um, cognitive mm-hmm. decline. And one aspect that we are looking into is doing s- screening, not just for cognition, but concurrent PTSD as well as depression and anxiety. And we'll be following those patients long-term to see kind of mm-hmm. how our interventions from the mental illness, you know, psychiatric perspective changes the cognition as well. So yep. um, there's right, definitely yeah. a lot to look into that there. Oh, absolutely. Well, you may, the, the listeners may not know, but Dr. Sorio is an amazing therapist. She's an amazing coach. And so I would be very happy to refer any of my clients to her. I would refer anyone I could refer to her who was like a, a friend that needed, you know, a specialist or a coach. So um, when I was, you know, or more of the specialist geriatric psychiatrist when I was back in that area, now more of a coach, lifestyle coach, mentor, inspirer. So she's had her own journey and she's done her own work and she can now translate that to other people. So I'm excited to to have you on here, Dr. Sorio. And Sam, so nice to meet you. Your intellect and sort of academic digging is fantastic and I appreciate that. Impressive. So you guys, when you see these slides and the handout, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So we will do part two. If you have any questions thoughts, concerns, um, you can shoot me an email and we will try to address those in the next time we talk. So we'll leave it there. 